My name is Ben Briard. I'm on the product management team here at Red Hat. I've uh, basically spent the past five years kind of operating in between uh, RHEL and OpenShift, uh, kind of covering all of our immutable operating systems, uh, container runtimes, image offerings, and things in that kind of that world. Um, and now, uh, really focused on on Edge and what it takes to be successful there. Um, yeah, so I just hit 10 years at Red Hat, so it's uh, it's awesome. I have the greatest job in the world. I get to play with all the fun stuff uh, and work with uh, all these super cool uh, use cases from customers. So uh, it's absolutely great. And yes, I at one one time had an RHCA. Uh, one day in the future, I hope to uh, update that. But you know, we'll see how this goes. Okay, so what is Edge? Um, well, for everyone's edification, oh, that's terrible. It's yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll keep we'll keep moving here. Um, basically, uh, we now have the situation where we have sources of data all over the place, and there's all kinds of use cases to capitalize on this data quicker, faster, more efficiently. And in some cases, we've reached the limits of where we can actually ship data. Uh, to a cloud or data center environment to process this. And so putting compute closer to these sources of data, sometimes those sources could be humans, sometimes it's uh, sensors, it can be all types of use cases, but uh, that's typically the combination of what we're talking with Edge. And so, of course, you guys can probably imagine um, all of the things that we take for granted inside of the data center uh, or cloud environment are now luxuries from an infrastructure side that may or may not exist uh, at the edge. So um, that's a, that's kind of a key thing. And and one another point I would make is depending on what industry you're in, edge is going to look completely different. Uh, sometimes it will kind of look and feel like a remote office maybe. Uh, it's totally different for uh, telcos and content providers and so forth. Um, in the industrial and manufacturing space, it looks quite different as well. So um, every industry kind of has its own take, and so it's I, you know, it's it's good for us to look at this from a holistic view, not not really just from one industry, and realize that uh, you know it, it does vary quite a bit. If we step back and kind of look at common challenges here, um, we do see that scale is is often associated with these um, in a data center. Pretty common for us to look at the tens of thousands, approaching hundreds of thousands types of deployments. Um, in Edge, though, it's often that these numbers start in the in the millions range, and and you can just imagine uh, trying to trying to perform a task on a million uh, devices. We start we start hitting like limits of what you can do with protocols and things of that nature, and so uh, it it we have to look at the scale problem. Uh, very differently in this world. Uh, in terms of just interoperability, uh, I think I think of right now we're kind of seeing the West is kind of um, the the West, excuse me the edge is kind of like the wild west in, in a lot of ways. Uh, in terms of just what hardware is available, what accelerators are being used, if any. Um, oftentimes there's kind of a, a existing legacy footprint and how newer systems are interacting with that, or maybe they're interacting with um, uh, like 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 hardware systems talking to PLCs on a manufacturing line that they can't stop for safety protocols. And there's, uh, it's just a, it's, it's a lot of moving pieces that's uh, going to continue evolving and adapting a lot over the next few years. Um, but uh, how these protocols work at a very low level, uh, sticking with the manufacturing case, is there, there's not a lot of commonality between the vendors and types of communication that we see at a very low level. So it's a, there's a, it's a, it's a complicated uh, matrix of layers of technology uh, that that inter intersect here, and of course, from a consistency perspective, uh, you know, basically keeping things updated. We oftentimes talk about the convergence of operational technology with IT networks and systems, uh, and that right there um, creates uh, sometimes organizational tension, uh, but also creates huge opportunity for us to solve problems and really work with customers to get, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, we can meet uh, basically requirements and, and, and have these systems kind of converge over time. All right, and we look at kind of an application lens here. You guys are gonna see that uh, 
all your traditional cloud native and, and a lot of the AI ML stuff. Um, this slide should really say OpenShift and, and RHEL on it uh, because these are really the types of applications that we see being super relevant in the edge space. Um, there's already a lot of a lot of like traditional footprint out here. Like I said, RHEL specifically has been doing edge computing long before we had that word or that label as an industry. Um, and so there's a there's already a sizable uh, footprint out there for that. Uh, we do see most of the growth happening on the cloud native side. Could just be uh, repackaging of existing applications as well as literally forklifting uh, workloads uh, from other environments and putting those out out at the edge. And then, of course, the AI ML side uh, is obviously growing really, really fast. And whether you're training models or just executing them, uh, you know, close to, to sensors, for example, or you know, doing inferencing on, a, say, like a, a webcam or these types of things, uh, you know, we basically see that OS is being, uh, or RHEL specifically, being a great fit uh, for a lot of these use cases. All right, so I'm going to put this in context and. Uh, We've got a lot of cool deployments uh, for OpenShift in an edge context. Um, we can now do smaller three-node clusters. Uh, the remote workers landed in, um, in 4.6, or much, much more progress has been made there. And then the single-node work is, is coming, uh, is on the way. Uh, but today, just to put this in context, we're talking about just like, what can I do with Linux? Um, and so you could think of this, I've had two people come up with this term. We you know we have K8s and there's kind of K3, which is like the slim down Kubernetes. Kind of think of a lot of this is like K0, right? Like what can I do with container runtimes and, and, and the OS? Um, and it turns out you can actually do a heck of a lot here. Um, and so just again, kind of going back to the, the trends that we see happening, uh, a lot of times you'll see edge computing connected somehow with some type of digital transformation uh, type of initiative. Uh, could be, uh, you know, the IT, OT convergence is another huge, huge thing going on. Or really people just trying to make uh, better use of analytics on top of data uh, to either make them smarter from a competitive standpoint, improve customer experience, or really just increase like operational efficiency. All of these are kind of tend to be the bigger trends that people are going after. I talked a little bit about the verticals already, so I'm not going to rehash that. But uh, what can you do with kind of a standalone OS? Um, at this point, uh, really just a, a container host that where the concept of a cluster actually doesn't add value. Um, and so these like independent uh, systems that just once you put them in motion, keep going. Um, that's a that's a really really common use case here that uh, we can solve really well, uh, particularly on smaller footprint devices, either just uh, edge servers or a, a gateway to where we're just really just passing packets back and forth. Uh, talked a little bit about computer vision a second ago, where we're doing inferencing on on like a feed of what's coming into the system and trying to identify what's happening on it and make decisions from that. You know, kiosks are still a huge thing, particularly for like a like in the in the transportation uh, space, that's uh, that's still we see huge investment happening there, and then of course we see the classic kind of IoT use case rolling up under under edge as well. All right, so with RHEL in the next update, which will be 8.3, we are on a time-based model now. So the November release, uh, we kind of have uh, these four things landing, which represents you know, our first step in the journey of, of kind of adapting RHEL for Edge. Um, we, we're not finished with this release. This, again, this represents kind of that first step for us. And um, effectively what we have is this, this tool called Image Builder, and we'll, we'll go over this in more detail, but basically we can generate these uh, pretty, pretty small footprint um, operating system images uh, that can either be purpose-built uh, for a particular piece of hardware, use case, workload, uh, or a kind of a generic container host. Uh, and then we get a whole bunch of benefits uh, because we're using RPM OS tree in the background, which makes it super easy to update, super easy to um, be really efficient with those updates over the wire. And then we have some cool technology that will help us roll back if we need to. Uh, and we'll take a look at those in more detail. Uh, but before we get into kind of some demos and some other things, uh, I want to kind of talk a little bit about running containers 
with traditional workloads. Uh, we, I mentioned earlier that there's pretty sizable legacy footprint uh, in a lot of these edge uh, use cases. And I want to, you know, basically there's no technical reason why we can't just drop in containers next to uh, traditional daemons running on a Linux system. It works great. Um, now, depending if you need to orchestrate and do fancy things with those containers, you know, you will probably hit the limits of that pretty quick. And that's obviously where Kubernetes has a massive amount of value. Um, but if this is more of a static workload type case, um, this is pretty simple to do and works really, really well. Again, one of the things I do want to point out is that in RHEL 8, we make it easy for just regular daemons running on the system to really present the same kernel uh, primitives that give you container isolation to services installed on your system. So it's something I find in talking with people that a lot of, a lot of people don't know that we can easily add all kinds of namespaces, um, uh, I'm trying to think, like seccomp, these types of things are really easy. And, and there's really a, a list of like, um, kind of like eight line items you can put into a unit file. It starts, starts an app and it will just basically give you that very, very similar type of isolation, which is super cool when you consider uh, kind of how connectivity is increasing and how, uh, how important security is and will continue to be in the future. Uh, okay, so uh, we are, from a container runtime perspective, we are talking more about the Podman side of the house right now. Hopefully everybody here is kind of familiar with the differences of Cryo, which is meant to talk to the Kubernetes CRI and Podman, which uh, uses basically all the same same underlying components, but it's kind of standalone in terms of it has a CLI, and now has a, has a Docker compatible API in this version that's gonna come out in 8.3. Uh, and just super lightweight uh, runtime and works incredibly well. Uh, one thing, one thing we like about it for this use case is we have much, much better integration with Podman and System D uh, than we ever had in the Docker world. And so, again, this makes it super easy to just, uh, if you again going back to kind of that static workload model, uh, have container images that can auto restart. They just like they just the system knows how to run these just like any other service. Um, so Podman is really great for that. Um, so again, we got the new API coming in in 8.3, and then another thing that makes this whole model really, really nice is this auto update um, based on the tag on your on your images. Uh, so this is something that's technically going to land as tech preview in this release, uh, but if you're managing container life cycles at your registry, which you should be doing, everybody should be doing that, uh, and if you want to have a certain tag uh, land on a certain set of boxes. Maybe you're going to phase in or have your whole, all of them are going to pull the, the prod application. Um, basically, we can have timers on these nodes and now check that tag at whatever interval is appropriate and just kind of auto pull that image and update uh, as new ones are made available on the registry. So again, little features like that make life uh, super simple and again, easy to scale because these are all client initiated um, actions. That's nice. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're getting in 8.3. So I mentioned Image Builder is kind of the, the front door of this tool. Um, this is made available via the cockpit UI. There's also a CLI and an API for this. Um, but we really log in and, you know, approximately four clicks, you're going to get the default image. If you need to customize it with RPM content, you can. Here I'm going to include CRUN as I really enjoy CRUN because I like using Secrets V2. Uh, it's super fast to instantiate uh, containers as well. But here we'll just we'll go ahead and we'll commit this to the blueprint. Again, you don't have to do this. By default, we'll give you everything you see here listed on the slide, a small at core install with um, uh, our container tools as well as some goodies that we'll look at in the next couple slides. Uh, but you see, I just select the image content, uh, rel for edge, commit, and this is going to generate an RPM OS tree commit that we can then serve out uh, from a central place. And just, again, this is going to give us that uh, remote update capability. And that's it. It's going to kick off the build right here. Uh, we can see this going. Uh, and it happens pretty quick. Uh, on my junky laptop, this will complete in, I don't know, seven, eight minutes if you're running on good hardware expect faster results. All right, uh, so let's talk about the mirroring and providing these updates. So uh, again, we create the initial image 
the way you saw, uh, we are going to create updates for these images using that same process. Um, so that's one thing you have to understand that you are now driving these boxes and you're driving that update cadence and how like you have fine grain control over everything that happens on these systems. Um, and again, once these updates are created, we can put them on any type of web server. So if you want to just Apache box or host a container somewhere, uh, if you're going big on a prod environment, uh, you know, please use a CDN of some type, uh, just depending on what type of load and number of nodes you, you have. And then these last two, we've kind of itemized a couple of the configs on your systems that are going to control where they're looking for this web endpoint. And then the last one is one of my favorite things where we can, if, if a new update is, is published, we will automatically pull that down on the nodes. Uh, and I'll pick that up in a couple slides on how we actually take the update and accept it, but it's super easy to stage these updates locally on the systems. Um, okay, so let's take a look. I am using the terminal on uh, the web console, and I wrote a little script so I wouldn't fat finger things for everybody. Uh, but if I check the status of that image build, I can see node zero is finished here. And this Compose image is really just going to download it and give me an artifact that I can work with here. Uh, and this happens super fast since it's local. But I, I now have this tar file with that commit of the RPM OS tree locally. Um, and now I'm going to build a web-based server to host my commit. So I'll, I'll spit out the, the file here. You can see it's super simple. I just give me Apache extract this tarball that I made in image builder and then go ahead and serve that. Uh, so no magic at all is, is needed here. Um, so just go ahead and build that image. It's going to happen quickly because it was already built on this node. Um, and then I'm just going to bind it to port 8000 so I can run this particular one as rootless. There's no, again, no requirement to do that again, but this is a good proof point that you can, you can host these any number of ways you want. And then once that's going, I'm just going to I'm just going to curl uh, the the latest ref of the commit. If you guys have used RPM Ostry or looked at it, you'll know that it it's kind of modeled after Git. So a lot of those same um, same ideas and concepts uh, that you, you probably are familiar with from Git, uh, our RPM Ostry basically leverages those. All right. So once you have uh, made an image from Image Builder, that is uh, a good way you can easily serve that up. And let's talk about the, o the updates themselves. So day one is pretty simple. Um, updates, though, a lot of edge environments, some of them have like amazing data center style uh, networks, which is super fast. And, you know, efficiency at this tier is not, you know, it's a nice to have, but it's maybe not a requirement. Uh, but in some environments, we have just horrible connectivity, uh, like like microwave links that make make modems look really, or old dial-up modems look really fast. Um, you know, retail, we still see like fractional T1s and these types of things. And so what's cool is even if you have constrained networking, th this now makes it possible uh, to update those devices because you can, it's much, much more efficient by only sending the delta of the update over the wire. Um, if you if you generate what's called a static delta, uh, you can actually pull pull it over like a, a much much less TCP overhead, uh, which is which is just great and again increases that efficiency. Uh, but even if you have really really great uh, connectivity and bandwidth isn't like a near a scarce resource, you still probably want to be using that for uh, your applications of workloads, not you know, OS updates and these types of things. So having that efficiency really helps regardless of what type of infrastructure you have. Um, and again, this is just a great side effect of, of using RPM OS tree natively for all this stuff. Now provisioning here. Um, if you're familiar with RCOS, you may be wondering, why is this not Ignition? Uh, well, we're looking at Ignition and we may, we may include that in the future as an option. Uh, we're certainly open to that. Uh, but right now, a lot of these devices have, um, uh, like, like, like we, we just see this gamut of hardware that has all these weird requirements. And so Anaconda works incredibly well uh, to fit uh, to fit this uh, RPM Ostry commit onto those systems. So 
Anaconda is, um, just, again, just makes this really, really easy today. And so this little example just has a kind of a bare bones uh, top section. And then really, instead of having it present packages where you would normally list out all the content to install, we're just going to use RPM OS tree commit. And we're going to point it to your, your mirror. If you point it to your production mirror, once you deploy the system, it's going to know where to look for updates automatically. Uh, so that's probably a good thing to do if you can. Um, and that's all you need to do. Uh, you can do any customization stuff and percent post uh, if needed. Pre is still there. Um, but kind of a good rule is to keep these as simple as possible. Uh, okay, and so that's how we can easily just get the commit onto your devices. And now uh, a little bit about RPM OS tree. Uh, it's just really gives us this uh, great kind of a uh, the kind of the best of both worlds. If you think of a, a traditional like um, like embedded type firmware, you know, like your your router that may have a an A and B partition on it. Uh, so we kind of blend that AB update model with like the benefits of a package based distribution. Uh, so it's nice. So if we ever need to make a change to what's on a system, make you know. Because one of the key things here is to be able to adjust for change that happens in your environment over time. Um, and so this, is a, this model is super easy to adapt over time, uh, which, is, which is really powerful. So again, we get the benefits of this AV model where we can fail back if, if necessary, uh, as well as kind of that flexibility uh, with the packages, which is great. Uh, so really everything of the operating system that lands under slash user uh, gets swapped out with the or at least at least in each commit there's a the full os in there right and then once you pull that into your repo and clone it locally again we're only going to send a delta but you get um you know that full full commit locally where you can go to either state of the device uh, we do maintain state uh in slash var and etsy so uh, you, the whole operating system is not technically immutable, like from the strictest definition possible. And that's not a bad thing <laughs> because uh, true immutability often requires a significant amount of infrastructure to be available. And that's not something that we, we can count on in these environments. So again, maintaining your configs and container images and these types of things is generally a really healthy and convenient thing to do. Um, so that's it, and we always get this known state that we're operating in on the, on the system, which is powerful. So I mentioned earlier that we can automatically stage these updates in the background, um, and so that's that's a great way to approach it. That's probably what I would do, but it depends on your environment on what you should do. Uh, and then whenever an uh, update is staged, um, typically you may want to align to a maintenance window. Again, a lot of these systems are responsible for like critical infrastructure. And can't just can't just accept reboots, you know, like free form, like we would expect in a cloud environment. And so uh, it's pretty easy to schedule reboots with a timer, or there's a number of ways you can use any type of a management uh, system. Uh, but once you have a scheduled reboot, when they come back up, they'll be at the next update automatically. Uh, so that's that's how that works. So updates will cost you a reboot. However, uh, as long as you time that, typically. A going for, accepting a reboot uh, should be less than less disruption or potential unknown disruption than updating a live running system and making changes on the fly. This is a really good model. Uh, okay, so last little screenshot is just to kind of give you guys a look. If you haven't played with RPM OS tree on a system before, I'm going to SSH into uh, this is a bare metal system I'm running. And again, I'm using the web console terminal to do this. I'm running a container that's just sucking the four cores of this little box dry. Uh, and I check the status. I'm running a single commit. So this box has just been provisioned from, uh, from Image Builder. That is the commit of the update. And I'm manually triggering an update because uh, I don't want to wait for the timer to do it automatically for me. And this particular one just pulled in, uh, you know, new uh, kind of the container tools packages have been rebuilt for this one. And we can see when I check the status that I have a new deployment here that is staged and not running on the system. And of course, my workload has not been interrupted at all. It's still going. Now I'm forcing a reboot just to just to move into this really quickly. You can see how I got impatient and tried to SSH before the system came back. 
Um, and I checked the container runtime, and of course my application is running as expected uh, because it is being managed by System B. And we can see here the asterisk has moved up, and I'm in my new update. Now again, this this uh, this model is familiar if you've you know if you've been using uh, you know like things like Atomic Host in the past, or maybe Silverblue and Fedora. Rail CoreOS does use this model as well. So hopefully this uh, this makes sense uh, to everybody. Now, this last thing is kind of what's new and unique uh, to what we have in RHEL. Basically, this technology is green boot, and it's the first time that I'm aware of where uh, we can have custom health checks uh, for applications running on the system. So let's say my node has like three critical things it needs to do. Uh, I can basically write scripts, and Greenboot gives us this framework to run those scripts that integrates with the boot process of the system. And if they fail using a counter system, so it's not strictly like, well, it's it's as flexible as you need it to be. Um, if if an update causes you know one of the critical roles of that node to fail, we can revert the state of the system and go back to where it was working, right? Um, so super super powerful here. And uh, yeah, was, we're we're basically really excited uh, to have that have that linkage again between the workloads and um, and the operating system update level. Uh, one of the customers we worked on on this uh, capability really closely with, uh, you know, their their feedback to us is basically the combination of RPM OS3 and Greenboot is going to save us millions of dollars with our deployments. Once these systems get provisioned at the edge, the goal is to not go back and revisit them physically. <laughs> and so uh, you can imagine how having having this type of safety mechanism in place is a big deal uh, for a lot of people and moving into this space. All right. So with that, um, basically, uh, you know, again, I mentioned 8.3 as kind of the first step in our journey of kind of meeting the challenges of the space. Um, we do see the security story of RHEL um, being a huge value to edge um, deployments. Um, in fact, that challenges uh, we talked about earlier in this talk, I would say all of those challenges kind of kind of live on top of the security concern, right? Because again, in the data center, um, things tend to be uh, physically protected. You know, we have cages, <laughs> we have badges, systems, uh, and you may or may not have any of that uh, for the edge. Uh, and so uh, being able to get to promise that same level of security without physical protection is huge. And so um, RHEL, RHEL has a huge value proposition there today and one that's going to get even better uh, in the future. And the other thing around edge in general is, uh, you know, we see complexity as being uh, a huge challenge for really any IT uh, project in general. Uh, and we see Edge or RHEL in particular at solving a lot of the complexities in this space. Uh, and so hopefully, kind of the the little example and these features we brought through in eight through in eight three. Hopefully, you can kind of see that um, you know if I need to put these applications that's relatively static on some smaller devices, maybe they're big servers. It doesn't really matter. Um, and just keep these, maintain them, steady state, make sure they're updated. Uh, this is a super simple way to just to just go meet that need and be successful. And then, of course, uh, why not do that uh, by leveraging uh, kind of the existing investments in people skills and technologies, right? Uh, that people know and love from Red Hat. So that's a that's a, a key value prop in everything here. And so uh, at this point, I guess everybody's probably going crazy thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to get my hands on this and try it to go uh, go conquer conquer Edge in my, in my environment. And so, um, one, you've come to the right conclusion. Uh, and two, it's super easy to go do this and get your hands on it. Um, if you go to the OS build uh, GitHub repo, uh, we really have kind of this whole thing document it out here and you can walk through it. It's super simple. You can just do it in a couple of VMs if you like. Um, really, how, however it makes sense, but it's, uh, you know, any, it'll take you anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes depending on depending on your, your setup. Uh, super simple. And of course, we'd love to get feedback from you guys, uh, hear what you think. Uh, and again, this will, uh, this will GA pretty soon when 8.3 hits the streets. And we will update this demo to reflect that. 
And with that, I, uh, I guess that's, uh, that's our look at how we are adapting uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for the Edge. And I appreciate everybody's time and being here. Ciao.